This week, we give our first impressions of the 2021 Toyota Sienna, and we answer questions from all over the world, including how to track down parts for a cherished older car and how to keep snow and slush off your LED headlights. Next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome to Talking Cars. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. Hi, I'm John Linkove. I'm Emily Thomas. So we have a number of new vehicles at the track, many popular models. So we are going to jump right in with our From the Track segment and talk about this week, the 2021 Toyota Sienna. So just rattling off my array of specs here, the new Sienna comes exclusively as a hybrid a combined 245 horsepower um, between the electric drive and the 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine, electronic continuously variable transmission, CVT, front-wheel drive standard, but all-wheel drive available, something that the Sienna always had offered in the past. Um, Safety-wise, Toyota Safety Sense 2.0, forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection, all standard, and blind spot warning and rear cross traffic warning standard. Often those are left out. So this is a great thing. That's part of that package now. Um, a rear seat reminder system um, for um, children's safety, also standard. Um, EPA estimates on the Sienna are impressive. 36 miles per gallon combined, oddly both 36 highway and 36 city. Um, The all-wheel drive is one lower at 35 combined, so pretty impressive. We bought an XLE version for our testing program, added the premium package for a total MSRP of $43,570. And when I think of minivans, I I think you, John, and you, Emily, are in what they would consider the typical demographic, you know, family, young kids, um, very active, going back and forth. Um, I also know that Emily's young son, Micah, has already shared with me in a um, meeting that he very much likes the Sienna. So, Emily, do you (laughs) agree with Micah that the Sienna is a great car? Micah's basically trying to take my job. In That's case right. you haven't noticed. <laughs> I think we're done. We're done with the with the segment. Let's move on. <laughs> um, I do agree with him in some things. I think I went into the Sienna being like, okay, I really want to like this car um, for all the reasons that you described, right? Like, um, it's a great family car. Like this this segment of vehicles is, you know, what a lot of people would consider if. You know, they're expanding their family or even if their children are, you know, getting older and you need more room and you are doing all the sports and the carpooling and all the things that come with having a bunch of kids, right? Or even like one or two kids. You just, there's a lot of stuff. So I went in really wanting to like it and I came out kind of with mixed feelings about it. Um, There are things that I really do love about it. I Love some of the more um, traditional touches of like physical buttons on the around the infotainment area. I love the traditional gear shift. Um, I love that it has like all this really great cabin storage that's available. You know, there's um, you can have a full second row bench if you want, or you can remove that middle seat to give you a little bit more variability. Like depending on, are you taking like six kids to soccer practice or (laughs) do you only need, you know, two people in that backseat? So there's a lot of variability and there are things about it that I do like. I love the family friendly kind of features, right? Like you mentioned, they have two new standard systems. They have a rear belt minder system, right? Which tells you if um, your rear passengers are buckled in. It tells you if they unbuckle during a trip, which I think is awesome, especially, you know, with booster age kids that can't access that buckle by themselves. Or even, you know, when you have your teenagers in the back, you want to make sure that they are getting the most amount of safety as possible. Um, And then they also have a rear seat reminder that's standard, which it basically just reminds you to check your back seat for any belongings or, you know, precious cargo um, at the end of every trip, which both are super fantastic, super um, important systems that I personally am um, very passionate about. So I'm really happy to see those things. And then, you know, I like the sort of like 
sleek modernness to the front part of the cabin, the driver area. You know, it looks nice. It does. Um, but there were a couple of like, I feel like almost missed opportunities, especially when I think about some of the other minivans that we've tested or even some of the larger SUVs in comparison, like still moving those second and third row seats around is just really clunky to me, right? Like some of those things could have been motorized, <laughs> like you're having a redesign. And I was looking at, you know, our road test video from the previous generation of the CNN. I was like, some of that looks exactly the same. And I almost wish that they had brought a little bit more finesse to those things, like accessing the third row and, you know, folding the seats up and stuff like that. So I feel like there were some missed opportunities, but there's a lot that you can really love about the interior and about how it's going to fit your family. The leg room in the back is great, which like we had a minivan growing up and all my brothers are younger than me and taller than me. So <laughs> they would have loved the extra leg room, <laughs> you know, and I'm sure that, you know, other people would feel the same way. We've crawled into the back of some of these, you know, minivans or even three row SUVs and you just feel so cramped, but it's not that bad this time around. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Emily. It's, I, you know, I threw it to you guys with young children, but with my big children, it's still great in terms of um, a travel vehicle. You can't, can't beat a minivan. So John, what about like the driving aspects of the Sienna? Any thoughts from you? Yeah, it's, I actually put some, took some people who uh, are Sienna owners or were looking to replace their Siennas. You know, so from our findings, it, it's a hard. It's it's definitely hard to keep it in EV mode. Um, like a lot of Toyotas, like a lot of Toyota hybrids, it, it's it's a Fabergé egg under the throttle, under the gas pedal, where you know you, just a slight push and you've cracked that egg and the engine kicks on and it's and you know you're you're not in electric power. Um, it, it's it's definitely there for cruising. It's definitely uh, you know it's easier to almost keep it uh, an EV when you're on the highway than driving around town. Um, and that's just you know I'm driving it or peers at CR are the only person. Imagine having it with, you know, three kids and another two adults and bags. Like you're not going to really be in EV mode driving around town. You know, the four cylinder gets loud. People who are coming from a V6 powered uh, Odyssey, Honda Odyssey, a V6 powered Toyota Sienna, you know, previous generation, they're going to probably remark that this is a little different. And the, the people who I took around definitely said, Oh, it's louder. Oh, you know, it's it's more raucous. My my V6 felt smoother. You know, it was quieter. Um, you know, and they notice it. One of them actually went and bought a, a Hyundai Palisade instead of the new Sienna. Um, you know, it drives like a minivan. You know, nobody expects it to be a sports car. I mean, Honda Odyssey. That yeah, definitely a little little more enjoyable to drive. Enjoyable. Um, the joke is always if you you know when you get married and you have a BMW 3 Series in your driveway, then you have kids. You get the Odyssey. Um, yeah, it's it's a big wide vehicle, and that's what it is, and it's safe. Uh, suspension soaks up bumps well. You know, it's 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 a very competent, fine vehicle. Um, but that four cylinder engine is going to be surprising to people who are you know going to start looking for it. And you know, when you wind it out on the highway, and that ECVT that you mentioned doesn't have steps, it doesn't shift like a like a like it's pretending to be an automatic transmission. So it just it just you know you're you're getting that engine sound, and there's probably a little less sound deadening in there because you know. To try to uh, say you know save for fuel economy, save weight wherever possible because it is a big, a big vehicle. You know they do compensate by not having uh, by having electric all wheel drive. You know so motors versus you know two a tube you know a drive shaft, um, which is a benefit for weight savings. But yeah, you could you could tell it it definitely gets loud very easily in that car. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm somewhere in the you know kind of echoing what you both said, but also at the risk of being a little repetitive, I got in that. And one, like Emily said, I had very high hopes for it because if if I had, when my kids were younger and I had an all wheel drive option for a minivan that, you know, and we didn't have test cars, obviously that would have been a, a vehicle I would have considered. Um, I love the visibility and the openness of the cabin. It's so refreshing, actually, with many vehicles being somewhat squatty, particularly forward visibility. It deteriorates going rearward. The head restraints and the pillars get in the way when you have to merge. But love, love, loved that. Again, two things. And, and this is where I might be a little repetitive to things I've said before. Very much like the Highlander hybrid, the RAV4 hybrid, that change from electric to the engine kicking in very loud. Not my expectation for a hybrid vehicle. Don't care for it at all. My other piece that I've said before is I want a hybrid vehicle 
that doesn't make remind me all the time it's a hybrid. And in this, for the first time in a long time, the brake pedal is non-linear. That's the best way. I it, it feels like it grabs and then it goes a little more, or lets go a little bit, particularly in parking lot maneuvers. It was a little bit disconcerting. Like you thought you had good brake uh, pressure and then it seemed to, to do something odd. I don't know if it was the regenerative braking of the hybrid system, whatever. Um, a little odd there. And then I found the steering um, surprisingly light. Um, not even in line with, you know, I, I always talk about Lexus, for example, it's, it's a rather light steering feel. This was even lighter than that. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what others think, what our ratings come out. The Sienna has some catch up to do in terms of catching up to where the Odyssey and the Pacifica are in that segment. They sell many, many more. In fact, the Pacifica in 2020 was the top selling, um, minivan, perhaps because of its all-wheel drive option. So uh, stay tuned. Obviously, we will have all of our testing results, et cetera. But um, 2021, Toyota Sienna minivan. So we're going to move on to audience questions. But before I do that, I just wanted to let people know or remind people about our Talking Cars donation program. Again, just a reminder, Consumer Reports is a nonprofit organization. Um, memberships and donations keep us doing all that we do, um, including this show. Any amount helps. Um, go to cr.org slash give talking cars. Um, and we'd appreciate anything you can give. So um, moving on to your questions, obviously, keep them coming. Talking cars at iCloud.com, 30-second video clips written. Um, we love, love, love them. Our first is a video question from Fernando in Honduras. Take a listen. Hi, Talking Cars. Greetings from Tegucigalpa. Behind me, I have a 2005 Chevy Colorado crew cap. I'm thinking about keeping it so it becomes a classic but I'm having more and more trouble getting the required spare parts. So I'm having second thoughts. I would appreciate your advice if it makes sense. Thank you for the advice and keep up the good work. So yes, Fernando has his 05 Chevy Colorado. He wants to make a classic, but John, having some trouble with parts, what would be your advice? Yeah, so I would, I would say... Looking internationally is going to be your friend, um, certainly depending on generation, certainly sometimes an international version of a vehicle is going to be different than another international version of the vehicle. You know, you uh, it may be named the same, but, you know, it's, it's a different platform, what, what have you. So restrictions there, but uh, common parts you, you should be able to find online. And, and it may not be an exact Chevrolet branded or an AC Delco or Delco uh, a Delco branded uh, part, you know, part of uh, Chevrolet's parts parts group. But aftermarket parts are going to probably be your friend. Also, just from rebuilds, uh, you know, vehicles that are at salvages, uh, you know, they've gone to a junkyard or something like that. Um, a lot of people are going to be, there's going to be people who specialize probably in Chevrolet uh, trucks, at least, if not just Chevrolets in general, that you'll be able to find it from. Um, you know, certainly after 10 to 12 years, manufacturers don't have to keep parts available, uh, at least for the United States and, and internationally, it, it, I, I don't know that for sure what those what the rules would be for international uh, for other other countries. But that's going to be the, the best way, you know, Facebook groups, online uh, forums, you know, part sharing. I mean, I just ended up buying an older car from the 80s. Um, and, um, you know, researching just where am I going to find some of these parts because they're, you know, they're, they're NLA no longer available for for, you know, years. Um, and it's a lot of people who are, you know, Vehicle breakers, they break down vehicles and you're going to get parts from there. So um, that that's my advice. That That's probably going to be the best way. A junkyard, so to speak, is going to be your friend, but an online search will uh, will, will go a long way for that. Oh, that's great. And, and I also think too, Fernando, um, it depends on how original you want to keep it. So I think I've shared, you know, we have the 1967 Mustang and admittedly, that's a, a super classic, if you will. Um, and we can get any um, reproduction part for that car. Getting an original part is one thing. Getting any reproduction part is actually pretty easy, you know, depending on how, how, how original you want to keep it. Our second question comes from Nick. And Nick says, I recently decided to treat myself and bought my first brand new car ever, a 2020 Kia Soul. 
I love it, but with winter here, I have found a problem with the LED headlights. I can't keep snow off of them. I have waxed the car twice since buying it last spring, but snow loves to block my headlights and fog lights. Do you have any tips for how to keep the LED headlights clean in winter? So, um, it just so happens that we still have a 2020 Kia Soul in our fleet. And I've always said we love video questions, but how about a video answer? I did my own little trial. Here you go, Nick. I treated one headlight with um, some de-icer windshield wash and left the other one alone. And I took a ride around. As you can see, even after snowing overnight, the lenses didn't accumulate anything, but I don't think they would. It didn't quite work in that the for those of you who are watching or listening, the Kia Soul lamp is really encapsulated. The hood line comes down over, and then there's this big shelf underneath to, to capture snow, but it kind of protects the lens from falling snow. I think maybe, Nick, what you experienced is um, ice and snow being splashed up from underneath, um, and then, again, not being... Um, melted off by the cooler LED lamp. Um, I would avoid trying to treat that with anything that's like um, uh, oil-based that, you know, you read online, cooking spray or um, things like that, because when those get cold, they get foggy. You think of grease in a pan when it cools. It's, it's opaque. Um, I would stick with things that are more for automotive, either a windshield wash, a wax, a rain repellent type product, and see if that works. But it's true. LEDs do not generate the heat that... Um, halogens and HIDs do. If people are shopping and they live in a cold area and um, the LEDs are an option, maybe avoid them. Um, the, I do think the manufacturers are going to have to figure something out as LEDs proliferate the market and are more standard rather than optional. So great question. Thanks. So everything aligned there. We have a Kia Soul. We had snow. Hopefully that's helpful. Nick, we would be interested if you have success with any of those remedies because you are not alone. So great question. Um, moving on, uh, the next question is from Rafi in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I know that DX is Honda's cheapest trim level, while EX is their top of the line. Toyota has LE, XLE, etc. Do these initials mean anything or are they short for anything? I would like to see an explanation on this very important topic. John Linkoff, what do you got for Rafi? Uh, so I, I think I might be reading a little sarcasm into the very important topic <laughs> that Rafi says, but it is, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and, I, and in a lot of it, Historically, you know, it, it meant something and it still does mean something to manufacturers, but now it just it just is like appendages onto the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, I reached out to some manufacturers. I, I heard back from one, but there's other information that, that I pulled up. So for Toyota, for example, there's a there is a hierarchy. L entry level. L E luxury edition. S is sport. S E sport edition. S L E sport luxury edition. Um, and so on. You have sport rally. Interesting one, you see that they their pickup trucks, they have SR5, right? You know, the Tacoma mm -hmm. SR5 and such. Sport Rally 5-speed from back in the day when having uh. a 5-speed transmission was a thing, you know, just like when you saw cars with ABS badges, um, analog brake system. E X S E Extreme Sport Edition, XR Extreme Rally, etc. So you get all the way up to XLE, which is Executive Luxury Edition, XLS, Ex Executive Luxury Sport. Um, you know... DX was Deluxe, CE Classic Edition, VE Value Edition. Um, Honda has a similar, you know, where they start generally LX, then Sport, EX, EXL, EX Luxury. Um, it, some people have said it's EX Leather, uh, it, just because that's when you tend to get a leather leather trim and say a Honda CRV or Honda Accord, the luxury version brings leather. Um, you know, so, so they do mean something, you know, manufacturers throughout. I mean, Jen, I think when we were talking about this, you know, we brought up some of the, uh, you know, the, the suffixes on, on vehicles like BMW 3 Series. Okay, so there's the I, you know, injected, you know, the, 2000, the BMW 2002 TI, which was, uh, let's see, Touring International, but then there's TII, which was Touring International Injected. But then you were talking about also the displacement, right? Right. 
some of the letter or the numbers were the displacement at one point. Right. And now, you know, with turbo engine, I mean, before it was the 320, three series, two liter uh, engine, you know, 328, 2.8. Now, you know, they're all 2.04s, you know, so you would have a ton of BMW 520s, you know, with something else on it. So they they have now moved just historically keeping just numbers as, as you know, not displacement, but just certain levels of the model. So they do mean something for manufacturers. Some with the model names, as we've seen, they just change model names constantly and, and also some some keep them. But those uh, those appendages, those suffixes definitely meant uh, meant something in the day. They do internally, maybe not as much now selling. It's just more of, oh, that's the next level up, next level up and top level. Yes, yeah, it's like you say, they may mean something to Toyota or to Honda, but maybe not to us. It sounds like a great like autos trivia game. Right. Like, what are all these mean? <laughs> and, well, and it, it, you know, and you think back to, you know, years ago, it you know, a luxury version would have power windows because the regular version had manual windows. You know, the luxury version, you know, now it's well, the regular version has two way power seats. You know, the luxury is four or eight. You know, I mean, there's so many luxury features now that are even in standard cars that it, it, it's hard, you know, hard to say like what really truly makes it a luxury version, the inclusion of leather and wood, for, you know, because there's so many nice features in a, in a, in a base model, you know, uh, let alone a mid level, you know, to the top. So there we go. Rafi, you can make up a trivia game with all those all those uh, answers that John gave. So great question. Um, our last question is from Abdullah from Dubai. Anybody notice the international level of questions we have this week? It is so cool. So Abdullah writes, I'm a 17-year-old petrol head, but have been thinking recently about passenger safety. Modern cars these days have an incredible amount of front seat adjustability. In the event of a crash, is it possible a front passenger could be in an unsafe position? Are there any tests for passenger safety in different positions? Emily, being our safety guru, what do you have for Abdullah? Well, first off, you're 17 and you're thinking about front passenger safety. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> I don't think at 17 I was thinking about that. <laughs> so, and yet it's my career now. But uh, I think it's great that you're already have that kind of that kind of perspective and mindset. So, if you look holistically across like crash programs here in the U.S., I can't speak to. Um, the Dubai market. But here in the US, you know, we have different programs, you have your regulatory, you have the NCAP program, which is consumer information, and you have IHS also consumer information. So if you look holistically across those three programs, there are different recline angles that are used for the vehicle seat back, um, depending on the seating procedure that they use, or which dummy even that they're testing with. However, those recline angles are still going to kind of be within what I would determine as, or I would call it normative limits, right? They're still going to mimic um, typical driving posture. They're not going to be the extremes of somebody driving, you know, really reclined. One, if you're super reclined, you wouldn't be able to drive. You wouldn't be able to see over the dash. You wouldn't be able to, you know, reach the steering wheel properly, any of those things. But even still, if you are more reclined than the norm, you know, that's an exception, Really, crash testing is meant to um, give us insight into how, you know, for the average consumer, for the average driver, how are they going to uh, respond in a crash? How is their body going to react? And so you're not going to see these kind of extreme cases. That being said, though, you also ask, you know, are there unsafe positions that a front passenger could be in? And absolutely. See, the thing is, when you're in the front seat, your seatbelt anchors, your shoulder belt anchor is going to be on the B pillar, which is that post that's behind your seat, right? Uh, on the door frame. And so since the belt is anchored there, as you recline your seat, you are moving further away from that shoulder belt anchor, which means that in the event of a crash, you know, it's just going to take you that much more time before you interact with your belt and are able to benefit from the protection that that seatbelt is going to be able to provide for you. The seatbelt and all of its advanced restraint systems like the pretensioner, like the um, load limiter that's there. So being further away from your seatbelt because you're more reclined can put you in a more dangerous position. It can make you less safe, right? So, you know, there are, you want to make sure that whenever you're sitting in the car, no matter what seating position you're in, that you have proper belt fit. That is so key. I've said this before and I'll say it again. 
Your seatbelt is your first line of defense in a vehicle. Um, you need to make sure that that shoulder belt is adjusted in the front seat. You have those adjustable um, shoulder belt anchors. You want to make sure that it is adjusted so that your belt falls across the middle of your collarbone and the middle of your sternum. Your lap belt is going to sit over um, your upper thighs and low on your hips. Belt fit is very important and it's what's going to keep you the safest because it's going to keep you in the right position for all the other safety mechanisms. And, and just, Emily, kind of the converse, when I think of kind of petite drivers or passengers for that matter, you also don't want to be too close, right, for airbag engagement. I think the rule is 10 inches from from the wheel. Um, so you're, it's certainly a balance of comfort and safety. Um, I, I know I'm forever saying to my teenage son, get your feet off the dash. You're going to get a knee in the eye um, if that airbag goes off. Um, what is? So. I just have to ask, what is with that when you see people? If, that <laughs> seems so uncomfortable. <laughs> just getting your feet up and wedged in the window like that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we're getting old, John. Maybe our legs won't even do that anymore. Even but when yes, they could I, do that. I, oh. I drive by. And you just think of if that airbag deployed. When they're in exactly, position. you do not oh want to put gosh. yourself in the deployment zone. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's great <laughs> things to think about. And I agree that Abdullah is thinking about that stuff. Fantastic. So that will do it for this episode. As always, keep watching, keep listening, keep your questions coming. Talking cars at iCloud.com. Continue to stay safe and be well. And we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.